But uh, the thing you're looking for, or think you're looking for, is what you're doing. Is what's called you. Only, of course, as we all know, uh, we've got ourselves into the idea that oneself is so difficult to see. Because it's like, uh, as I've often said, trying to bite your own teeth or look into your own eyes, and you can't find it. It's always behind. It's like your head is, uh, from the optical point of view, a blank space. Neither light nor dark. It's right in the middle of everything. And so, one of the great tricks of gurus is to set people looking for their heads. Now, the trick to that is, of course, that uh, you are perfectly well aware of your head, only not in a form in which you expect to be aware of it. You expect to be aware of your own head in the same way as you're aware of other people's heads. But that wouldn't be true of you because you've got an inside view on your head. You have an outside view on other people's heads because, of course, you're taking an inside point of view. But the way in which you are aware of your head is in terms of what you are seeing and hearing. Because all sights and all sounds are what the nerves inside your head are doing. That's how to be aware of one's head. You are aware, therefore, of yourself, the mysterious self that you have, in terms of experience. Because there isn't really any difference. But that always escapes people, you see. So perpetually, so long as you don't understand that, you can be talked into going on to all kinds of weird excursions. And just so long as you believe it, you're a sucker. You're hooked. And it takes a tremendous inner confidence and nerve, finally, to say, hey, don't pull that stunt on me anymore. I, I, I see through your game. And uh, because gurus are very clever, at putting you down but they're just trying to see how strong you are testing you out see if they can hoodwink you so long as they can you see they're going to go on doing it because they're going to get you to the point where they can't do it to you anymore then they'll graduate and so uh, <laughs> one of Rinzai's students after he saw through it said well there wasn't much in Rinzai's Buddhism after all. Of course there wasn't. He said boldly and straight out, my teaching is just like using an empty fist to deceive a child. You know, when you play games with a child and pretend you've got something here, and the child goes into all kinds of um, tizzy to get you to open your hand and show what it is, and then there's nothing. Fooled. So you, so you, you can be fooled as long as you can be fooled. <laughs> when you can't be fooled, you don't ask the question anymore. Because it's all become clear. It's all become clear that there is no puzzle about this universe. What makes you think there are puzzles about this universe? Very simple reason. You're trying to explain it. And furthermore, you can very simply see that what makes things complicated is explaining them. When somebody explains to you how a flower works, and he's a great botanist, and analyzes all the innards of a flower, and shows the channels, the fibers, the processes of reproduction, and uh, so on that go on in it, everybody stands fascinated. See, how complicated that is. How clever God must have been to create that flower, to have all that complexity going. It isn't complicated at all. It's only complicated when you start thinking about it. Because the vehicle of words is a very clumsy one. And when you try to talk about the processes of nature, what is complicated is not the processes of nature, but trying to put them into words. 
that's as complicated as trying to drink up the ocean with a fork. It takes forever.